Well, ladies and gentlemen, our reading today comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 57 to 80. Luke chapter 1, verses 57 to 80. We're continuing our series in Luke 1 and 2, Christmas Basics. And after I've read this, we're going to spend a bit of time thinking about it. You can follow along on the screen or in your Bibles at home. This is from the Christian Standard Bible. Luke chapter 1, verses 57 to 80. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she had a son. Then her neighbours and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her his great mercy, and they rejoiced with her. When they came to circumcise the child on the eighth day, they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother responded, No, he'll be called John. Then they said to her, None of your relatives has that name. So they motioned to his father to find out what he wanted him to be called. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they were all amazed. Immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. Fear came on all those who lived around them, and all these things were being talked about throughout the hill country of Judea. All who heard about him took it to heart, saying, What then will this child become? For indeed the Lord's hand was with him. Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and provided redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times. Salvation from our enemies and from the clutches of those who hate us. He's dealt mercifully with our fathers and remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. He's given us the privilege since we have been rescued from our enemies' clutches to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness in his presence all our days. And child, you'll be called the prophet of the Most High, for you'll go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child grew up and became spiritually strong, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I was chatting to a friend from We War the other day uh, in the Woolies car park. There's a sermon outline there. You can follow along and you can ask questions uh, at the end using the comments box. So I was chatting to a friend from We War the other day in the Woolies car park. Uh, she'd come to Narrabri for dinner with her kids and a drive-by of all the Christmas lights. Uh, I love, well, our family loves the drive-by of Christmas lights. Uh, some of the light arrangements are simply astounding. Uh, some are beautiful. Some are whimsical. Some just overwhelm the senses with an assault of every sensory nerve in your eyes. Others are humorous. And all of them show a level of dedication and care. As you drive around in the car, you can hear the gas, the yells, the exclamations. You can see the fingers point and the head swivel. You can enjoy the wonder and praise, even the awe at what is being seen. It got me thinking this week after that conversation about the whole gamut of Christmas emotions. Of all the seasons and holidays in the calendar year, Christmas seems to have developed a stranglehold on the emotions of wonder and praise and awe. The wonder doesn't stop at Christmas lights. It's there in the eyes as they behold the Christmas tree and all the gifts laid underneath. The awe is not just connected to gifts but also to food and family and celebration and the praise is often abounding. Now I know. I know that these are all ideals, even stylized with the backdrop of Hollywood. But they are there, this wonder, this awe, this praise. But if you pause and consider them and the objects that stimulate them, these emotions at Christmas can often have pretty shallow roots. The Christmas lights are packed up each year and a blown bulb can wreck the whole thing, let alone a blackout. Uh, The presents, well, at least one of them will be broken by the end of the day and sometimes the wrapping can look better than the contents. And the food, well, it gets eaten, cleaned up and by the next day it's called leftovers. 
at such a time, is there a source of wonder, awe and praise that is a little longer lasting, perhaps even a little more significant? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you with this snapshot of an elderly couple who never thought they'd have the pleasure of a child. And thank you that you've granted them the answer to their prayer. Thank you for the way in which we see fulfillment here. We pray, Father, that out of this fulfillment, you'll create in us the emotions of wonder, awe, and praise, and most importantly, obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm at point two on the outline, like any good author, Luke has set his scene. We know his purpose, don't we? He wants to reassure Theophilus, uh, a Roman public servant, that what Theophilus has been taught and possibly trusted about Jesus is true and certain. Uh, we know Luke's method. He's investigated from the very first everything about the lifetimes and purpose of Jesus Christ. He's taken that investigation and turned it into a writing that is in orderly sequence. And we know his backdrop, don't we? The bigger context for what he's doing. Uh, it's all about fulfilment. He views the events and claims of the life of Jesus through the lens of the promises of God. The promise of God to roll back sin and bring blessing through Abraham's family. The promise of God to have this world restored under right rulership under the kingship of his son, who was going to come from the family of a bloke called David. The scene's been set. Two births have been announced. One boy is to prepare the way for the other boy. One boy will be a prophet from a family of priests. The second will be a king from the family of kings, David's family. Both announcements are surprising and unexpected. Both were by the hand of an initiative of God. Both announcements were fulfillments. Both announcements were greeted with some level of scepticism, weren't they? Zechariah, the recipient of the first announcement, was struck dumb by God in judgment for his death. He was a godly man, but he needed to learn obedience. Mary was given a statement of fact, a statement of truth, if you remember from last week in response to her queries. Now, Mary's gone off in haste to the hill country to visit her cousin Elizabeth and was astounded at the fact and affected by the truth, nothing will be impossible for God. And she breaks into song. Well, we've left Mary as she left Elizabeth at the eve of the birth of this baby that Zechariah wondered about. Look at verse 57. Now, the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth and she had a son. Then her neighbours and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her his great mercy and they rejoiced with her. Luke's focus on fulfilment stands out here. Uh, It's a simple relay of the birth of Zechariah and Elizabeth's boy. Matter of fact, kind of like what you'd expect from a doctor. The language, though, is the language of fulfilment. It'll be repeated in Luke 2 verse 6. Now the time had come. And the description of the neighbor's response is likewise a language of fulfillment. Remember what Gabriel had said in chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, you'll give birth to a son, you'll name him John, and everyone will be praising God, overjoyed at what you've received. That was the announcement nine months earlier, and now we see it. Happening here in verses 57 to 58, Luke 1, 13 and 14 are fulfilled in Luke chapter 1, verses 57 to 58. And on a purely superficial level, uh, we shouldn't be surprised, should we? Uh, God's just done what he said he'd do, kind of like what God does all the time, even down to the reaction of the neighbours. But on a more considered level, it should probably stir up in us some emotions, shouldn't it? Emotions perhaps of awe and wonder and praise. But these things have happened exactly as God had said they would nine months earlier. These things have happened. Impossible things have happened. These things have happened. And the overwhelming response is that of joy and wonder and praise. Just listen to the neighbours carrying on. And the wonders don't cease there. I'm at point four on the outline. Look at verse 59. When they came to circumcise the child on the eighth day, they were going to name him Zechariah after his father, but his mother responded, no, he'll be called John. Now we know that Elizabeth and Zechariah 
are godly. We know that they are righteous, so it shouldn't surprise us that they're fulfilling God's law. The naming's a pretty simple matter, most people would have thought, until Elizabeth throws a whopping great big spanner in the works with a statement. Now, there shouldn't be a surprise here, should there? After all, Elizabeth and Zechariah would have discussed the matter. Most parents talk about the naming of their first child. The emphasis on fulfillment, though, has been raised again. Remember Luke 1.14, you'll call him... Yeah, that's right, John. Not Zechariah. Not one of the uncle's names. Not one of the cousin's names. No, you'll call him John. And there are witnesses to the moment. Everyone's gathered. They, the witnesses, are gathered to name this boy. They are so shocked by Elizabeth's statement that they turn to Zechariah. They know he can't speak, so they ask him to indicate what he's thinking. Look at verse 62. So they motion to his father to find out what he wanted him to be called. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John, and they were all amazed. Immediately his mouth was open, his tongue set free. He began to speak praising God. This layers fulfillment on fulfillment, another level of fulfillment on another level of fulfillment. Zechariah's dumb mouth is opened after he writes clearly that his name is John, just as Gabriel had said in Luke chapter 1 verse 20. This man had been judged because he, godly as he is, did not believe that God could do the impossible. As he writes the name of his son, his lips are loosened as God had said they would. Fulfillment and fulfillment and fulfillment. But there's even more going on here than that, isn't there? Did you pick up the change in tense between Elizabeth and Zechariah? His name will be John. His name is John. Elizabeth is future. Zechariah is present. I think Zechariah, in those months of dumbness, those months of silence, has been able to start learning that God can be trusted. He'll he'll do the impossible. He doubted it at first, but now he's learned the truth. And so the present tense there, I think, saying, listen, his name is John. Before he was born, his name is John. As he was predicted, his name is John. From the very beginning, his name is John. It's not just raw emotion that Zechariah is spilling forth here. It's actually obedience, isn't it? As he sees this fulfillment unfold in front of him, he himself is a fulfillment act, isn't he? As his tongue is loosened, as he learns obedience and praises God, as he himself fulfills what God said in Luke chapter 1, verse 20, driven by fulfillment to obedience, He can now understand the work of God as he should and respond as he should. And all of this is wrapped up like a good Christmas present. All of this is wrapped up in wonder, praise and awe. Look at verse 63. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John, and they were all amazed. His mouth was opened immediately. His tongue set free. He began to speak, praising God. Fear came on all those who lived around them. All these things were being talked about throughout the hill country of Judea. All who heard about him took it to heart, saying, What then will this child become? For indeed the Lord's hand was with him. Now, this is better than Christmas lights. This is better than Christmas tucker. This is better even than Christmas presents. This is God doing exactly as he said he would in living memory, in real time and space, with real people and a real baby. Now, before we unpack further the response of Zechariah, the question asked by the witnesses, and Theophilus could go and talk to them, everyone in the hill country, pick anyone, Theophilus, I've gone and investigated, you can go and check what I've done. The question asked by the witnesses is worth pondering. God's hand is here. What what will happen to this child? Now, we ask that question of our kids all the time. They always fill us with wonder, awe, and praise, don't they? I mean, for, for every child, every discovery is a brand new world, isn't it? Now, here's another full human being, but the emphasis is not so much on what this boy will become, but on what God will do with him. After all, the birth only happened because of the hand of God. This man could only speak because of the hand of God. This couple could only welcome a child in their old age because of the hand of God. The name was chosen by the hand of God. What's going to happen with this boy? 
Now, for Theophilus, the original recipient, the emphasis on God acting and the fulfillment that that has produced and all witnessed, all the emotions that have gone with it, all the evidence that has gone with it, for Theophilus, here is certain. Hey, mate, just go and chat with them. The whole hill country was a buzz. The same's the case for us. There is certainty here. As we watch this fulfillment unfold, as we see the change in Zechariah, as we see what Gabriel said would happen, take place exactly as God said it would, as we contemplate those overwhelming emotions that have risen up of praise and wonder of awe, I know that we're removed from the action, but praise and wonder and awe is thoroughly appropriate here and relevant, even for us. We have just seen events unfold exactly as God said they would, exactly as God said they would. Well, Zechariah's song of prophecy, it is a song of prophecy, isn't it? He's grasped by the Holy Spirit, just like Elizabeth was, and he speaks forth, verse 67. Zechariah's song of prophecy in the context is not just of his reaction at what has happened. He's not just reacting to the fact that he can now nurse his own baby boy. He's actually answering the question that's been posed. What's going to happen to this boy? (coughs) What's going to become of him if the Lord's hand is on him? And Zechariah states three truths. You'll see them there in your outline under point five. Look at verse 68. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and provided redemption for his people. God's come. Zechariah praises God because this fulfillment is about the coming of God. It's so certain. It's already in the past tense. There's nothing more, nothing less going on here than the visitation of God into a broken world. And the purpose of this is not so that God can just garner the praises because he's got a fragile self-esteem. Not so that God can show how wonderful he is. It's because God has come to provide redemption, freedom, setting people free, his people, his mob. And the fulfillment theme here is not just within the time frame of Zechariah's life in the last nine months. What has happened in Zechariah and Elizabeth with the birth of John is a statement that God is doing on the grand all of world, all of history scale, exactly as he's always promised. And we'll come to that in a moment. The amazing thing here is not that an elderly, godly couple have had their prayers answered, though that's amazing enough. The amazing thing here is that the birth of John is stating very clearly, God's come. God's here. And he's come to deal with us. Secondly, the big picture of this occasion is that God is doing exactly as he's promised to do. That's the second truth Zechariah wants us to grasp. God is doing exactly as he's promised. Look at verses 69 through 75. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of of his servant David, just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times. Salvation from our enemies and from the clutches of those who hate us. He's dealt mercifully with our fathers, remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. He's given us the privilege since we've been rescued from our enemies' clutches to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness in his presence all of our days. The theme of fulfillment is not just seen in what's happened to Zechariah and Elizabeth. It's seen in their fulfillment being part of God's greater fulfillment that God would save his mob. Let me say that again. Their fulfillment is part of the greater fulfillment of God's promise that God would save his mob. That that was promised to David, 2 Samuel 7, that reading we had earlier, that God promised to bring a king from David's family who would be God's own son, who would rule the whole world rightly. That was promised to Abraham. That other reading we had from Genesis 12, 1 to 4, that we've heard so many times. Remember, God promised to roll back sin and bring bring his approval through Abraham's family. This promise of God has its end point, not in his people feeling good, 
not in his people being rewarded, not even them having life that works out as they hope for. The promise of God made to Abraham and David being fulfilled at this time has its end point in humans being what God designed them to be. Did you see it there in verses 74 and 75? Since we have been rescued from our enemies' clutches, why have we been rescued? Well, Zechariah says to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness in his presence all our days. Put even more simply, it seems that Zechariah is stating that God doing as he says, that God doing as he promised, that, that God fulfilling what he said leads not just to praise, wonder and awe as we've already seen, it leads to God's people being everything God created them to be. His obedient representatives, showing him to the world, kind of like Zechariah learned as he pondered God doing the impossible. And at the heart of all of this, and this is the third truth in Zechariah's song, at the heart of all this is John preparing people for God's coming. Moreover, as John does this, his focus is the same as God's focus. Did you notice that there? Let me read verses 76 through to 79. And child, he's talking to John here. You can almost imagine him nursing this child as he prophesies and sings this song. And child, you'll be called a prophet of the Most High. For you'll go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Humans need to have their sins dealt with. That's the end point. The purpose. It's not just that an elderly couple can have a baby and have their prayers answered. It's that God himself has sent John to prepare for God himself coming to deal with the very thing that separates humans from God. At the heart of the humanity's inability to serve God as they should, at the heart of humanity's inability to take God at his word, is sin, the attitude and action that says, I'm God, God's not. And at the heart of that being dealt with, so the humans can do as they've been created to do, is forgiveness. And at the heart of forgiveness must be the one who's been sinned against, God. So God has come, stepped in, done as he promised to deal with the thing that separates us from him. In fact, that was at the heart of God's promise to Abraham, wasn't it? And really, when you drill down, that's at the heart of God's promise to David, God dwelling with his mob. And so John will get people ready for God coming to deal with the thing that has separated humans and God and broken this world, sin. That's what John's going to become, the preparer for the coming of God himself. You can almost see Luke joining the dots for Theophilus, can't you? If God fulfilled what he promised to Zechariah and Elizabeth, and if they responded with praise, wonder, and awe, and this led to obedience, just look at Zechariah, then imagine the enormity of God going further and fulfilling what he promised to Mary, and that's enormous. Moreover, the fulfillment in John will lead to the preparation of the fulfillment in Jesus. And that won't just be messages and proclamations and promises that gather dust it will be the dealing with the very thing that has damaged all humans and all of this world. It will be God dealing with sin. Wonder, praise and awe. I'm at point six on the outline. A Christmas has a bit of a monopoly on those emotions. Christmas lights, Christmas presents, Christmas food. Anything a little more substantial than these drivers of those emotions? Let me tell you there is. And it lies in God doing exactly as he promised in the certainty of fulfillment. As Theophilus looks at the fulfillment for Zechariah and Elizabeth of John's birth and the change this brings in Zechariah as he learns to obey, then Theophilus himself is confronted with an even bigger goodness, the goodness of John as the preparer. He's getting people ready for the big one, for his cousin, when God himself will come to roll back sin, bring his approval and rule the world rightly. 
And that leads not just to wonder and praise and all, but Theophilus, it's certainly true. So obedience, as God's people are saved to serve God, to proclaim him, to bear his image in the world. And there's wonder here, isn't there? At the light of God's promise dawning on the world and the prospect of the blackness of our brokenness being dealt with. There's praise here for the gift of God's Son as our saving King, our sins being forgiven. There's all here that God does exactly as he says. There's nothing more certain and there's obedience here, isn't there? A statement of obedience that we see in Zechariah as he stops second-guessing the goodness of God and starts obeying the good God. We're doing the same as Theophilus, aren't we? <laughs> Uh, We're confronted by all those same things. Can I ask you to think on this at Christmas? Can I encourage you to think how you can share a source of wonder and praise and awe much deeper than lights and food and wrapped presents? Can I plead with you to encourage each other as families, as spouses, as parents, as siblings to do the same? Can I encourage you to ponder with Zechariah as Zechariah must have? the right response to such amazing certainty, such wonderful fulfilment. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Really, we've we've only scratched the surface. It's remarkable, isn't it? Uh, Just even that song by Zechariah, the wonder and awe in the hill country, all those things packaged together. But at the heart of it, Father, is this very certain truth that you do exactly as you promised so we can be what you've created us to be, to to serve you, to represent you, to not just wallow in wonder, awe and praise, but to be active in obedience to the one who's already forgiven our sins. Father, at Christmas this year, please help us to proclaim this, to practice this so others meet you. In Jesus' name, amen.